Welcome back. This is going to be um, the part three video for uh, critical reasoning for the module on the informal fallacies. So we've got a bunch more fallacies to do. Um, this is a very interesting bunch uh, this time around. Um, these fallacies, or we're going to try to get through all the acceptability fallacies, which I don't know if you remember, but the acceptability principle was not one of my favorites on the Code of Intellectual Conduct. I actually, that was the one I thought should maybe be um, actually even removed from the Code of Intellectual Conduct. But the fallacies that show up here are really, really interesting. Um, I, they're some of my favorite fallacies because they're the kinds of fallacies that give you like a new frame of reference for how to think about um, our, the, our, the judgments we make and the kinds of reasoning that we do. It's kind of like, um, well, I'm, I've always loved using this metaphor of like conceptual technology, that as you like learn theoretical principles um, or different philosophical theories, that they give you more tools for how to think about the world um, and how to make sense of it. And these ones, I think, are they're they're cool things to point out and be like, oh yeah, that's a that's a feature of thought we should be keeping an eye out for, something to be sensitive to. So, even though I didn't very much like the acceptability principle, the fallacies that um, Edward Damer has grouped under this principle. I think are very interesting, and there's a couple of them that are actually some of my like most often talked about sorts of topics or like uh, subtleties of thinking that I, I think would be good if, if more people were sensitive to. So some cool stuff in here. There's a little bit of a grab bag, so but there, there's actually going to be a, a few that are kind of go, they're like a bunch of pairs, so there's going to be a bunch of pairs today. So that's what we'll be doing. we got a bunch that I'm, I'm hoping to get through, so uh, let's get started with it. <clears throat> so this is under the acceptability principle, and and I really I you know I'd say <laughs> these ones are maybe hard to organize. Uh, they're kind of potpourri, um, a bunch of different fallacies here, but I think they they really do have to do with the other principles. So um, you know there's connections to be made here, but um, I'm not going to belabor that too much with these lectures because that doesn't matter so much. But the first first one we want to talk about. Um, is equivocation. And equivocation is not really um, restricted in terms of the subject matter. Uh, this is something that can happen all the time. But I would say that this is a more specific sort of fallacy in as much as, um, well, this is, this is the first one of our pairs. Equivocation and distinction without a difference will actually go hand in hand. But equivocation is basically treating um, two different ideas or concepts or claims as the same even though they actually are different. So a failure to recognize that there is a, a contrast or a distinction that actually would affect the argument, that would cause either um, the premises to be false or to have a uh, poor support relation. Um, and usually it's a choice between one or the other. Um, it's like they can't. You can't have it both ways. Um, you can't have both meanings, uh, and yet treat them as if they are the same meaning. And but maybe you need both of them. So I could look at some examples here. But before we do that, really quickly, distinction without the dif without a difference is the pair to equivocation, because the problem with distinction without a difference here, attempting to defend an action or position as different from another one with which it might be confused by means of a careful distinction of language, when the action or position defended is no different in substance. From the one from which it is linguistically distinguished. If equivocation is treating two things as the same that are really different, distinction without a difference is treating two things as different that really for all practical purposes, and by the way that's an important phrase for all practical purposes, um, are the same. Okay, So um, a failure to uh, um, a, a failure to draw a distinction, that's equivocation, and distinction without a difference is um, making a distinction where one is not really required. Um, what I like about, uh, before we get into some more of the details of these things, what's kind of, I, th I think this is a good framing device for understanding how equivocation and distinction without a difference are a useful um, bit of conceptual technology like I was talking about. Um, there's a metaphor from Plato, way, way back ancient Greece, where he's talking about something that uh, is even kind of an old-fashioned word even in philosophy, and that's the word ontology. Ontology is the study of being, 
Um, but really, I'd say the best way to describe what ontology is about is how do we um, conceptualize reality? What do we recognize as existing? How do we populate our picture of reality? And what is in it? So what, what exists and how does it exist? What kind of reality does it have? So you might believe that minds exist, but you might think that minds are only really just brains. They're really just physical processes. There's nothing more. There's no sort of thing like a soul or something like that. Those sorts of choices about how we're going to think about reality are issues of ontology. They, they are also, under a more familiar word in philosophy, um, metaphysical questions, but ontology is kind of like the, um, the choices we have to make about how we conceptualize our picture of what's going on metaphysically, what's going on in reality. Um, so Plato's talking about ontology, and he's talking about some of the um, philosophical issues about ontology, and he uses this metaphor of carving up the world with concepts uh, the way that you would carve up a chicken. So if you you've got it, you've got this chicken and you have to carve it up, uh, you know the different bits of meat and stuff and the guts and the bones and right and you're going to you're not just going to start taking a big cleaver and just chopping at it and turning it into a bunch of uh, just a big mess. You're gonna instead cut the chicken at the joints. That's the easiest way to cut the chicken, and that's kind of how um, Plato is. He's using this metaphor of carving up a chicken about how we use concepts to make distinctions in our experience and recognize some realities versus other realities, um, and that we should be striving to conceptualize the world in a way that makes sense with how the world actually is. That's like you've got choices to make with the carving that you do of the chicken, but there's also the chicken that you have to negotiate with with your carving. You can't, you don't have a lightsaber or something. You know, you have to. If you're working with a, a metal knife or something, you, maybe a dull one, you've got to kind of take your advantage where you can and carve around the joints. Um, same thing with the concepts that we deploy on, the, on reality. So you can think about equivocation and distinction without a difference as fallacies that have to do with how do we wield our mind through concepts in order to carve up reality and organize it and make sense of it. So if I want to recognize that oh, this experience is kind of like another experience, so they should be put together into a category. Or whether I want to say, oh, no, no, these experiences were different in some important way, then I'm, then I'm carving a distinction between the two of them. Either way, I'm still using concepts. Whether I'm putting things into categories, that still requires me to kind of carve out the category, right? Even that it just includes a couple things or maybe more things that I'm putting in that category. Or if I'm saying one thing's in the category, one thing isn't, then I'm drawing a line between them. So when we conceptualize our experience or the world or anything, um, we're sort of making cuts. And we might make cuts in different places. And when we're in that activity of making cuts, we can do it in, in good ways and maybe in some bad ways. So we could be carving it on the joints, or we could be kind of missing it. And equivocation and distinction on a difference are ways that we miss it. OK, so that's a good framing here of like kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about equivocation and distinction without a difference. We're talking about this sort of basic aspect of our mental life and how we think about experience um, and the world and that we have a kind of judiciousness in how we deploy concepts and these are a couple mistakes that we can make in how we do that. I think this is great to think about just on its own. Like ontology is one of the more um, I think fascinating topics in philosophy. It's actually kind of the one that I got started on too when I first started studying philosophy in in high school but that's another story okay so let's go back to looking at the um, specifics of equivocation and distinction without a difference with this kind of general framework in mind so with equivocation which I was sort of informally defining as treating things as the same that are really different here, here's some examples of that happening I have the right to free speech the right to free speech is a right to share my opinion publicly. Therefore, it is right for me to say whatever I want in public. If you're going to say that there's equivocation taking place, a good way to double check it is to ask, okay, what is the thing that's being treated as the same that is really actually different? And I think it's the use of the word right. Um, having a right to something um, is not the same as something being the right thing to do. In other words, 
Um, just because there's a space for people to have freedom doesn't mean that anything that they do with that freedom is appropriate or correct. Um, there's lots of things, there's a lot of freedoms that you have um, living in America. There's like a lot of rights that you have that the government you know, respects and gives you space to make decisions with your life. That doesn't mean that everything that people do with that freedom is for the best, that it is the right choice to make or uh, something like that. So that's, it's two different senses of the word right, two different concepts involved here that are being treated as the same. And once they're sort of disentangled from each other, we can see that the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. Here's another example. Philosophy helps you argue better. People are too hostile as it is in this world. I'd actually kind of agree with that. Um, we should not teach philosophy and encourage people to argue. Now this one's a little more subtle than the last one because it's not like a word, just like a single word like right that's being used in two different ways. Here it's something a little different. Probably something about how arguing is being equated with hostility, that those are basically the same sort of thing when they can be disentangled from each other. There's a, a it's sort of maybe, if we were going to bring it back to a word, it'd be how sometimes people use the word, oh, those people were arguing to talk about them fighting with each other, like some kind of antagonistic inter, uh, interaction. Whereas when we've been talking about arguing, we've just been talking about supporting claims with other claims. Nothing antagonistic about that. Nothing that inherently requires that to be something aggressive or violent or abusive, as I've been always arguing for the whole quarter. Like, there's a way to engage with truth seeking through argument and use critical reasoning and criticize each other. And we can do that in the framework of cooperative um, efforts working together, me and my opponent working together for some goal that's good for both of us, getting at the truth. It's something we both would benefit from. So that's possible. So. Arguing in the sense of fighting is different from arguing in the sense of supporting claims with other claims. So that's the part of the equivocation here. But notice how you know the the language doesn't come out that way. You kind of maybe have to listen to the ideas again, um, like has come up so many times in this class. What you really want to have your focus on is not English. It's not the language. It's the ideas that the language is a vehicle for. Okay. Uh, I love this one so goofy. Uh, this one's more just playing with language in a really uh, ridiculous way, absurd way. A ham sandwich is better than nothing. Well, that's true. Nothing is better than eternal happiness. Let's just grant that for the sake of argument. A ham sandwich is better than eternal happiness. Hmm. Feels like a fast one was pulled here. And it definitely is some, it has to do with this phrase is better than and the way that it's being used in each of these instances is different. These two are the same the one in the first premise and the conclusion. But that's different than this second use. This is a kind of idiomatic phrase here. Nothing is better than eternal happiness. It's not talking about... Um, oh, and also maybe there's an issue here with nothing. So when we talk about better than nothing, that means having nothing. But this is eliminating all other things as competitors with eternal happiness. So it's equivocation going on there. Um, okay, and then this one, this one's a little more subtle. I mean, I'm, I don't know, I may actually, for the sake of time, not d dive into this quite as much, but um, this is this is an equivocation that I am particularly, uh, I guess you could say this is kind of like an axe to grind sort of thing. Um, and it actually is really relevant to um, something, we're, another fallacy we're going to talk about in this lecture that is ought fallacy, the, which trades on the distinction between descriptive and normative claims. But it's very easy for us to slide from descriptive to normative claims, and that can be a kind of equivocation too. And that's what's happening here. Um, this is certainly true. Unless we understand a culture's values, knowledge, and behavior from within their own cultural context, we'll be importing our own cultural uh, culture and arrive at an inaccurate analysis of what defines that culture. So in other words, if you're trying to study a culture and you're constantly projecting your own cultural values onto it in order to interpret it and make sense of it, then you're always going to miss the boat. That's not real listening here. So, And this is the kind of thing that is referred to as cultural relativism, this phrase, cultural relativism, in sociological circles, if you're just you're studying societies and cultures and their norms and beliefs. Um, then this is mandatory. If you just want to understand what is going on in that culture? What are what are what does it say? What is it what it, what does it value? What does it believe? How does it operate? What are the rules? 
um, or the boundaries of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Okay? But that's all just descriptive work. This conclusion, we cannot ethically evaluate the conventions and practices of other cultures, that's a little different. That's different from just projecting our own standards and trying to understand and make sense of another culture's standards. This is to make a evaluation. And arguably, this can be true without this being true. If you want to debate this one more with me, I'd be happy to discuss it. This has been a topic that I've discussed with very many students. And I think and it's, there's an interesting debate around it, too. I mean, relativism isn't moral relativism, the conclusion claim, is not obviously false. But I would argue that the, con that the premise does not support the conclusion in this case, that there's an equivocation going on around what relativism can mean, or that truth is relative here. To notice that um, there's a kind of subjectivity and potential bias that could happen if I'm trying to understand and listen to something through a lens that doesn't have the, that doesn't, the, those things aren't going on in the object that I'm studying, that's different from how we might morally evaluate things. For example, here's, this, here's a little example here. If you are um, a cultural relativist in the moral sense, if we can't evaluate conventions and practices of other cultures, then there's a lot of things that we can't make moral judgments about that arguably we w would want to make moral judgments about. Like, you can't condemn what the Nazis did, you know, that or, you know, um, uh, hardcore nationalist um, sort of supremacy groups that um, don't see other, uh, in, that they're kind of intolerant of other races or cultures. That we can't say that's wrong. We can't, we can't do that if moral relativism is true. But that's a, it's a big difference from um, just saying something about how we have to understand how our own culture creates a bias that might cause us to misunderstand another culture. Right? Um, again, if you want to talk more about that with me, I'd be happy to give you some arguments. The, the relativism debate is one of the classics in philosophy, and I think it's one of the most important debates to have. But a lot of times, um, yeah, so this is not a complete, I'm not accusing all relativists of guilty of equivocation. But I have seen very frequently that the sort of sociological thesis of relativism used to defend the moral um, notion of relativism, the, no, the notion of relativism in moral philosophy, and they're just not the same thing. These are two completely different claims. Um, so at the very least, regardless of what you think is right and wrong here, at least we can recognize that these are not the same thing. So it would be an equivocation to treat them as the same when they're really not. Okay. So if you're responding to this, you know, point out the two different meanings that you've got um, in the argument and how the person has to choose here which meaning they really want to mean. And usually what will happen, as I mentioned down here, is that once the meanings are pulled apart from each other, um, the argument's going to be in a rock and a hard place. Either they have to stay consistent the whole way through the argument, in which case the premises might be false, or... Um, they have to use it in the different ways, in which case usually the argument is not going to um, have a good support relation. Okay. All right, so that's equivocation. Distinction without a difference, like I mentioned earlier, is kind of the flip side of this. It's, a, it's making a distinction where that distinction actually is not relevant. Um, and there's one... There's a very important note here at distinction without a difference. This is something that every quarter I have some students... Uh, get confused on. So, warning, to pay attention here because this is a trap you want to avoid. A lot of times I get students who think that distinction without a difference is just happening whenever someone tries to make a distinction and fails at that. In other words, they're saying two things are different from each other when the, in fact they're exactly the same. And that would count as distinction without a difference if they're exactly the same and someone thinks that they're different. But here's the important thing about understanding the fallacy of distinction without a difference. Even if it's a real distinction, even if there is a difference between these two things that are being contrasted with each other, it may not matter. And that's the important thing to evaluate when you're trying to figure out whether something is guilty of this fallacy or not. Does it really matter? So let's go back to some um, of my martial metaphors that I, ha I shared uh, I remember I was using these kinds of like gun battle sorts of things as a way to uh, illustrate um, things going on with guarding, uh, assuring, and discounting way, way back, many, many units ago. Um, so imagine uh, an argument is kind of, a debate is kind of like this, that people are launching objections at each other, like shooting a gun or something. So 
when we were talking about guarding, I could try to make my position smaller, right? I could try to, like, hide, put myself in a defensive crouch, and then it's harder to hit me, you know, if you're trying to shoot at me. If I, make, if I present a smaller target, it's harder to hit. So I was like guarding. That was a way to avoid objections. Another way that you could try to dodge them is by imposing distinctions. So this, the kind of situation I'm describing is one of the classic cases where people are tempted to um, use reasoning that is guilty of distinction without a difference. So someone's attacking my position. And I want to say, I don't want to dispute the objection itself. Maybe I think it's making a true observation. If there's a certain logic to it that I, I think is irrefutable or I... I don't want to. I don't want to challenge it directly, because um, I think I can't. Maybe something like that. And but I might try try to say like, yeah, that's a great objection. I mean, I com I'm completely with you, but that's attacking this position over here, and beep, 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 I'm I'm over here. That you're not hitting me. Your objection definitely defeats your target, but your target is not what I am. So I try to draw a line in the sand to say. Uh, yeah, good shot. You got them, but that's not me. I'm over here. That's a way to try to dodge the objection, to say the objection misses, um, by sort of clarifying what position you actually occupy. And that can be a legit tactic, by the way. The problem is if the position I'm retreating to, or that I'm distinguishing from the one I'm saying I, I accept does get defeated by the objection, um, if that objection still uh, hits me, even though I moved position and I'm not this thing and that thing got hit, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like the image I like to uh, to paint with this would be like, imagine the objections are coming out of like a Tommy gun, like an automatic weapon, it's just like bullets spraying everywhere. If I'm if you know if there's a difference between me standing here and me standing here, but the whole thing is just getting riddled with bullets, then it doesn't really matter. You know, there, there might be a difference, you know, this position is different from this one, but the objection destroys all of them, so it doesn't matter whether I'm here or here with respect to the objection. So that's where the with a difference sort of thing, right, distinction without a difference, that part of it is pretty crucial. There's got to be some kind of context established for why, um, why you would want to try to impose a distinction or what you're hoping to accomplish with it, and even if you get a, a true distinction, it may not fulfill that purpose. In the most common case, I think, is a case of trying to respond to an objection. I have a little note here in my lecture notes at the bottom um, that uh, I say here about academics. And maybe you've encountered this with your instructors or, or just having some exposure to academic philosophy, but academics love to make little hair-splitting distinctions in order to protect their kind of pet projects or theories or ideas. Um, and, and even philosophers are guilty of this, absolutely. So you have to be careful. I say distinctions are cheap. There are distinctions everywhere. And this is why we can't restrict distinction without a difference to just cases where someone fails to make a real distinction. Because there's really everything is different from everything else when you start thinking about it. Every single moment can be contrasted with a different moment. There's also ways in which they're similar. You know, they're still principles of unity too. But if you're looking for differences, you'll be able to find them. Um, the question is, do they matter? Do they make a difference? Do they, is there any significance to that distinction that matters for the argument or debate that's at hand? That's the key. So the argument and the debate will always set the context here for whether it would be helpful or not. And an objection is a classic case. So uh, I've met many academics who are like, you present an objection to their position and they're like, oh yeah, yeah nice point, nice point, but actually my thinking is a little more subtle than what you're attacking. I'm, I'm not attacking the thing that you just described. I'm actually saying something different than that. It's like this thing over here. Uh, but it may, not, it, may, it may just be a bunch of dancing around that doesn't really matter. Sometimes it does matter, right? Sometimes the distinction could be significant. And I will totally be the first person to tell you that in philosophy, sometimes some hair splitting, things that look like hair splitting distinctions can actually make all the difference in the world, like a completely different worldview, if you just tweak this little idea, um, this little piece of conceptual technology about how we approach the world. I mean, everything could be different based on that just small little difference. Um, I've seen that happen. So to treat it, to kind of write off a distinction as being um, a distinction without a difference, when it actually does matter, like maybe not listening to it as carefully, would get you guilty of equivocation. Okay, So equivocation, distinction without a difference, are kind of two sides of the boat that we can fall off on. 
Either we're not being sensitive dis to distinctions to the extent that we should, we fail to respect the, uh, the contrast that's significant, or we see a contrast and make a big deal out of it when it really doesn't matter, when it doesn't have a lot of significance. And that's distinction without a difference. Okay, I think that's pretty good here. Oh, yeah, I love this example from the book. Um, I'm not a bad driver. I just don't pay much attention to the road. Even if those things are different things, it doesn't really matter, right? The, whatever objection there will be about you that are, is the basis from why you're a bad driver is probably also going to attach to um, you not paying much attention to the road. Or uh, the other one, the other one from the book that I remember is, uh, I don't have a problem with feminism. I just think that men should be a, in the head of the household. Be like, well, feminists probably disagree with you about that. So it, it does mean that you have a beef with feminism. Or even if you want to say okay, well, there's, you know, what it means to be a feminist might be different than that particular issue. Still, feminists are probably going to take issue with that as well. They're going to have something to say about that in debate. Okay. Um, all right, so let's move on. So this is actually where the lecture six ends. I, I split it into two lectures because of a, a seminar I used to use this material for. The class schedules were a little different. So here, um, starting lecture seven, still doing some more acceptability principles. Now we're doing this sort of grab bag of, of stuff all over the place. And we get another little pair, another little duo here, the fallacy of composition and the fallacy of division. Um, these also go hand in hand. So fallacy of composition is assuming what is true of the parts of a whole is therefore true of the whole. Fallacy of division is assuming that's what's true of the whole is therefore true of each of the parts of that whole. The problem in both of these fallacies is recognizing that a whole can be more than the sum of its parts. And this might look similar to, let's pull up our little drawing here. This might look similar to statistical generalizations and applications, you know, where we had a big category and then a small category of things that made up that big category. Um, like the people I've talked to in a poll and all Americans, right? These people are included in that set. And we were saying that you could use knowledge of some to figure out knowledge of the reference class or your knowledge of the reference class to then learn something about some part of that reference class. Now that's different from what we're talking about when we're talking about fallacy of composition and fallacy of division. As I say here in the lecture notes, when we're talking about statistical generalizations or applications, these are cases where the whole, the reference class, really is just a sum of all the members of that category, all the all the sort of potential samples here. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, you know, you can imagine all these subcategories of the reference class. And if you took all the members of that set and put them together, that's just the reference class. It's just a bare category. It's not uh, something that has properties that go above and beyond just the collection of things that make it up. But in the case of fallacy of composition and fallacy of division, these are happening where the holes that are made up of the parts also have something else that goes on in addition to that, that is more than the sum of its parts, that sort of idea. So I really like this example of like the choir. Um, just because all the singers in a choir individually are good singers doesn't mean that if you put them together and have them turn into a choir that they'll necessarily be a good choir. I use this example, if Eddie Vedder and Enya are in the choir, uh, I mean, they're, they're, I don't know if you know who Eddie Vedder and Enya are, but they have very distinctive uh, singing voices, and at least for my money, I don't think that they would necessarily sound very good together. But you could imagine all sorts of uh, examples like uh, other music artists or, or different singers that maybe listened to individually, they're really good singers, but they may not go well together. You know, you might like um, I don't know, you might like salted caramel ice cream and um, mint chocolate chip ice cream, but that doesn't necessarily mean you if you mix them together, it's going to taste great. <laughs> so that's, that's the issue of fallacy of composition. So you're, you're starting, your premise is about something about the parts of a whole, your knowledge of the parts of a whole, and the conclusion is, is uh, the inference that's being drawn is from that to something being true of the whole. Um, but when the whole is more than just the sum of the parts, then there's the, the risk of fallacy of composition going on. Okay, fallacy of division is the opposite of this. 
that assuming what is true of the whole is therefore true of each of the parts of that whole. Again, we could find some cases, um, I, I like teams, or um, like a team is a good example, or like the choir, you know, when we're, it's, like, the examples of people work really good. Because what happens with a person individually and what happens with a group of people together can be very, very, very different. Um, with fallacy of division, it would be like, hey, this group, um, like uh, there's a, a lot of teams, can, uh, this phenomenon happens with teams all the time. Like a team together might be really good because the team, the, pe the players that are on the team and how they practice to work together cooperatively is able to kind of make up for their individual weaknesses and they, they like complement each other in, in just the right way to be like super effective. But um, it may be taken individually, those players are not the best players that are playing the sport. You know, they might be, you know, they might be sort of mediocre players, but you put them together on this team and it's, it turns out to be more than the sum of its parts. There's something that's able to happen that, that makes for a very different situation. So here it's the same kind of mistake, but it's just a reverse type of argument where the premise is some claim about the whole, and then the conclusion is uh, an inference from that to a claim about the parts. Okay. So that's fallacy of composition and division. I don't have much more to say about these other than that if you're going to accuse someone of this, um, and again, you can't confuse, you, the statistical generalization, generalizations and applications don't apply here. So what's the difference? How do you know when the situation is one where there's the risk of this fallacy and when there's not the risk of the fallacy? Well, like I mentioned, everything depends on uh, whether or not the whole that's in question here has got any potentiality for being more than the sum of its parts. So you, if you want to make the uh, case that there is a fallacy of composition or a fallacy of division taking place here, then it's kind of the burden of proof is on you with that objection to be able to identify um, what is the sort of what is the thing that changes between the things taken individually and then when you take them together. Like I was kind of articulating in these examples, what are the reasons why what is true of the parts may not be true of the whole or vice versa? Okay, so that's the way to respond is to kind of explain your reasoning here to your conversational opponent rather than just be like fallacy of composition. You're talking about parts and holes. Done. It's not enough. Uh, if they're talking about parts and holes, there might it might be a good inference. Um, there's nothing wrong about talking about parts and holes, per se. It's just we want to be on the lookout for this kind of dilemma, for this kind of problem, where there might be something more than just the sum of the parts going on. Okay, I think that's enough for there. Let me know if you got more more questions. I'm kind of trying to whip through these. There's there's a lot of fallacies to talk about, um, so I, I don't want to belabor them too much. But if you got any questions about it, if my lectures are not sufficient to explain it, I would like to help you out with that. So please let me know. Okay. Um, all right. So now on to false alternatives. Now this is a totally different sort of idea. So a lot of arguments talk about possibilities, like there's a num maybe a number of different options. I mean, even pretty much any debate, um, multiple possibilities is going to be a relevant part of the, of the situation at some point because you've got different perspectives on the issue um, and there may it may not be a case of just mutually exclusive positions like this is true or it's false you know there might be other situations where it's like maybe this theory or maybe that theory or maybe this third theory or a fourth one or there might be some more things happening so anytime um, we're bringing up alternatives or possibilities and that's a part of the logic of the argument then we need to be careful about how that's being um, considered and whether there's basically some important possibility or alternative way of thinking um, or an alternative type of truth that um, is getting left out that is very important for the debate there's there's no way that we consider every single possibility and I'm actually going to talk about some of the subtleties there about with these practical issues about how we can't consider everything but um, the fallacy is not telling you that you need to consider every possibility. It's concerned about when possibilities are left out that are significant, that are significant possibilities. Sometimes that can be controversial. What one person thinks of as a significant possibility, someone else might not. So um, as long as there's a controversy, we shouldn't take it for granted that our estimation of what are the appropriate alternatives that should even be considered ought to be. 
I mean, to do if if we if we didn't do that, if we weren't cautious in that way, then we'd be guilty of question begging. We'd be taking for granted something that's controversial as a part of our argument. Um, I actually want to point out two particular examples of arguments that use um, a range of uh, of alternative possibilities as a part of how those arguments are formally structured. Um, and I think these are going to be pretty familiar to you. One of them you are almost assuredly familiar with, and we've I mean we've looked at this case in our own uh, class here this quarter. This is process of elimination. Two possibilities. It's not one of them. Therefore, it must be the other one. If there was some third possibility, like I'm like, imagine it had three possibilities. This is actually poorly formed. There should really be um, parentheses. Although in some advanced logic, you're allowed to make these lists. But I was telling you, you couldn't do it. <laughs> so just want to clarify that there. But imagine there are three possibilities here. Then the fact that P is not true wouldn't prove that Q is true. It's still open. Maybe it's Q or T. Right? So if there's a possibility that's left out, suddenly this argument no longer becomes valid. Same thing is true over here. You've got two possibilities. If you take the first one, you end up with R. If you take the second one, you still end up with R. So because you've got to choose one of them, at least one of them, R is definitely going to happen. I like to present this one as like, um, there are two doors, door number one or door number two, and you must choose at least one of them. Behind door number one is cake. Behind door number two is cake. So guess what? You're getting cake. That's what's going to happen. Or another example would be like, uh, let's say you've got two ways of getting home. You could take 405 or I-90. Um, if you hit 405, you're going to get traffic. If you go 90, you're going to hit traffic. So guess, re guess what? Get ready for some traffic. It's going to happen either way. This is kind of like a more, um, well, this is what we call constructive dilemma. Um, it's basically to say that it doesn't matter. Either way, something's going to happen. Um, but both paths are sort of required, sort of come to the same result. Um, so we, you're stuck with it. If there's another possibility, if there's another T over here or something, P or Q or T, then the fact that P terminates in R and Q terminates in R doesn't guarantee you that R would happen. Even if there's a consistency between those options, if there's some third option, like if you're like, hmm, take 405, take 90, what about jetpack? Jetpack doesn't have to deal with traffic. Boom. So maybe I'm not going to have to deal with traffic after all. Now again, this is a, actually that example is kind of perfect because I was talking about how what's important is leaving out alternatives that are actually serious ones. And I don't know about you, but Jetpack is not a realistic option for me getting home from school not gonna, or work or something. It's not going to happen. So even though it is a possibility, the fact that I have not dealt with that possibility in considering whether or not I'm going to get stuck with traffic doesn't really matter in as much as it's not practical. It's not a realistic option here. So you got to watch out for that. Um, so uh, you have to, if you're going to accuse someone of being guilty of this fallacy, false alternatives, you're going to have to make a case. You're going to have to defend how the the alternative that you think is being left out really deserves not to be left out. That it isn't. Um, it isn't something that's just obviously not a not an option. Um, that it actually has something behind it. Um, that's important. So, again, like I said, I just want to repeat this to make sure it's true. Uh, make sure you you get it. That um, pragmatic or practical concerns about making an option, maybe that's one that's more deserving of being considered, or maybe it's so insignificant that we don't really have to deal with it or tangle with it more seriously. Um, that this still um, can be something that is controversial. One person can think, oh, we don't have to think about that, and another person is like, uh, I think we kind of have to. And then in a, in a debate, in a cooperative debate that's really sincerely about getting at the truth, if you got a problem with it, then I have a problem with it. Even if my issue is that I don't think there's a problem, then we have to debate that. We have to debate whether it's a problem or not first before we can resolve the other issue. We can't take it for granted that our way of thinking about it is right and then just dismiss our opponent that way. Um, this is what happens all too often in positions. Maybe you've had um, management position uh, people who, like managers that you've had that are really bad at taking um, any kind of input or um, constructive criticism. They just dismiss it all. They're like, I don't think that's an issue. And if the employees are like, but we think it's an issue, the manager's like, no, nah, you're wrong. It's not an issue. Just ignore it. 
you know the fact that there's there is maybe another alternative here and one person just doesn't think that it's a realistic alternative means that that's now that has to get addressed you know we can't it's not just one of you know you kind of can get the pattern here from critical reasoning truth is not settled by opinion just what people believe just because you believe it that means nothing we need the argument to back it up so if there's a controversy if people think differently we need to look at something else we need some independent evidence argumentation reasons offered for why we should take one of these perspectives over the other so it's not just an arbitrary choice okay so that's false alternatives um, moving on let's talk about is ought fallacy so the is ought fallacy is actually a fallacy I've um, I've mentioned before in this class um, this is uh, when I've repeatedly talked about the distinction between descriptive and normative claims and um, the is-ought fallacy has to do with that distinction. So, you know, the, the cool bit of conceptual technology here is that to recognize that claims come in these two different flavors and to not confuse them with each other. That some claims are about just how the world is, what states of affairs obtain in the world. And other claims are about how things ought to be, what they should look like, what is good and bad, what is right and wrong, what's appropriate and inappropriate. Um, and even things like beauty, those are also normative. So we've talked about that before, and I've talked about, um, especially when we were talking about suppressed premises, how if you've got an argument with a normative conclusion, then it has to be defended by at least, it has to have at least one normative premise to even have a shot of being a good argument. If the only premises that are being offered to defend the normative conclusion are really descriptive premises, then that's not going to, that's, there's a logical gap here between how things are and how they ought to be. Just because things are a certain way doesn't tell you anything about how it ought to be. Things can be a certain way, and that can be good. Things can be a certain way, that can be bad. Things cannot be a certain way, and that can be for the good. Or they could not be that way, and it could be for the bad. Those are all real options. And what usually happens when people are making arguments in favor of normative conclusions, what's good, bad, right, and wrong, a lot of times people are guilty of this fallacy, but they, they sort of leave it implied. And that's why we had to think about this is ought fallacy in the context of suppressed premises. That's like, well, they didn't say it explicitly, but I bet we could figure it out. You know, if they're pointing at these facts to try to justify a moral conclusion, like how to evaluate the situation that those facts were true of, then we can assume a kind of some normative or moral principles that treat those facts as having a certain type of normative significance. So we can flesh that argument out with charity. We can read into things a little bit um, to help the person's argument make sense. And that's what the whole activity of suppressed premises was all about. But it still is a problem uh, to, to only use descriptive premises as a basis for a normative conclusion. And there are cases where sometimes it's not fixable through charity and suppressed premises, that someone really does, is really putting their eggs in the basket of just descriptive claims. Um, I was mentioning how we the equivocation about relativism that one of the claims is a matter of how we understand what are the conventions of a culture that's a descriptive project just what are what is it like even if we're talking about moral matters right what are the moral beliefs of Americans what does American culture stand for as meaningful and valuable that's a descriptive claim you remember when I was saying like if I say to some my friend um, I don't know my friend Johnny likes Nicolas Cage movies he thinks Nicolas Cage is a good actor. I'm not making a normative claim. I'm just reporting on what his beliefs are, what his normative beliefs are in fact. Not about whether he's right to believe that or wrong to believe that. That would be to make a normative claim. Same thing going on here. Um, if we're just trying to understand what are the moral conventions of a culture, that's a descriptive project. But if we're going to say that um, the culture has legitimate values, that those are the values that ought to have, or that people should act on those things, or not. Now we're making normative claims, and that's something different. You can't um, use one to understand the realm of the other. They're completely separate logically, and that's what the is odd fallacy is pointing out to us. Another one, uh, an example I like to talk about here that extends this a little further from what we've talked about before is the naturalistic fallacy. This is not one that you're responsible for. Notice it's not bolded in a bullet point like I've done for all the other fallacies with the definition. So this is not going to be on your list for the exam. But the naturalistic fallacy is a great example of a kind of subcategory of is-ought fallacy. So this is, this is a common one that you see. 
in naturalistic fallacy, it's it's cases of saying this thing is good because it's natural, or it's bad because it's unnatural. Um, uh, I I don't pick on well I'm I'm gonna pick on this one. I've heard a lot of uh, this argument has shown up a lot in the course of human history that homosexuality is immoral because it's unnatural because it's not a natural process. Even if that was true, and homosexuality is a natural process, um, there's plenty of evidence for thinking that's true. Um, but even if that premise was true, that it was unnatural, that wouldn't make it wrong, just on its own. That's not enough to get that to get an argument. That's a normative conclusion with only a descriptive premise. Naturalistic fallacy, fallacy is always doing this. If you just want some quick counterexamples here about how whether something is natural, or not just descriptive, right, and whether it's good or bad or right and wrong, that's normative. So there's there's just tons of examples here of cases of natural processes that are not that we wouldn't say are good, um, and unnatural or artificial things that we could say are positive that are positive. Um, cancer is natural, but it's not good. It's not a good thing. Um, huge hurricane destroys people's homes, kills people, causes all this destruction. Not good, but it's still natural. A lot of unnatural things that are also good. Um, oh man, the internet's unnatural. Uh, maybe, eh, maybe the internet's got some good and bad elements. We could put it that way, so it's not completely bad, <laughs> just because it's artificial. Um, technology in general is, uh, you know, there's some people who might want to make the case that technology is fundamentally bad or something, but the argument for that is going to have to speak at something else. Here, like, here's an example I like to use: health food. This is one of the most common contexts in which you'll hear people make the connection between healthy good, um, or uh, natural good, unnatural bad. But this, the real argument here doesn't really hinge on the naturalness of something. The naturalness is just kind of a, I'd say, a side effect or a, side, a, a writer principle or, or property rather than the thing that really makes the argument stick. The problem with unnatural foods is what they do to your body, how they create a a state of that isn't as healthy than something that than these naturally occurring um, things that we could eat. Now you could imagine if our evolutionary history was different, and maybe we could make food better for us, like through scientific design, than what nature could provide for us. If, in other words, unless we're being superstitious, which is also inappropriate, um, we should be able to say if natural is good, why is it good? What is it about the natural things that make them better? And it's going to ride on something that isn't about naturalness directly. It's about something else that's connected with naturalness. In the case of our our actual evolutionary history, um, the reason why eating natural foods is generally better for a human being, not always, but generally, is because we have evolved bodies that are responsive to those sources of nutrition. I mean, the kinds of things that we have as needs have evolved in conjunction with the other species of plants and animals that we're surrounded by. Um, so there's sort of, there's been a, a natural um, design, if you will, that has made for complementary properties here. Okay, That might not have happened that way. Um, evolution doesn't always optimize, um, even if there are a lot of trends that move in that direction, it doesn't always happen that way. And we could imagine that maybe there are some things that are um, that we need artificial means to deal with. Um, for instance, uh, people who have diabetes. You know, you got to do something artificial here to affect how your nutrition functions. Um, so even some naturally occurring foods are like, no, can't touch that, right? Or you can only touch it if you've got um, insulin shots that you're taking too. That's not that's not a natural process. So there's there's going to be if I'm not saying natural foods are not better. In many cases, they are. But the reason why they are better has to do with something else, not just the bare fact that they're natural. So that to make the argument that way would be to be guilty of the naturalistic fallacy, which is another version of treating um, uh, uh, is claims, descriptive claims, as sufficient for providing evidence for normative claims. That doesn't work that way. Okay. So that's is ought. Um, let's talk about misuse of a principle. We just got two more um, fallacies that I wanted to talk about uh, before we close up this lecture. So I think I think we're on good pace to do this.
So misuse of a principal, uh, before I get started on here, the important thing to, like I say here, the important thing to remember is that there are a lot of different uh, versions of misuse of a principal that we have to keep our eye out for. So there's going to be kind of um, two different contexts that I want you to have on your radar and two particular kinds of mistakes that can happen with how we are using principles. This is another one of my favorite fallacies to talk about. Because, I mean, principled reasoning is, uh, I mean, a huge part of being rational. So if you want to be a critical reasoner, I mean, you're going to be using principles all the time. And even if you don't care too much about being a critical reasoner, you're still using principles. It's just most of the time they're implicit or unacknowledged. But they're still a part of your reasoning there, too. Um, just the fact that you aren't evoking them explicitly does not mean that you are not employing them. And in fact, uh, one of my favorite philosophers, Immanuel Kant, is arguing that every single thought that you have is made on principle. That without principles in place, you wouldn't be able to have an intelligible thought whatsoever. And I kind of agree with him about that. So again, if you that's a tangent I'm not going to explore more now. If you wanted to ask me about it though sometime, I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, so misuse of a principle can happen in two settings. Um, Misapplying a principle or rule in a particular instance by assuming that it has no exceptions. Conversely, attempting to refute a principle or rule by means of an exceptional case. So the two, the two, the definition that we get already is talking about two different settings in which I might be making judgments or using principles. One, I might be applying a principle into a case. I might be like using that principle and say. This principle guides my thought or judgment or actions in this scenario. That might be one sort of setting or drama in which I misuse a principle based on how I apply it. But the other case is when I'm attacking a principle. If I'm objecting to a principle, if I'm saying this is a bad principle and here's the reason why, when I'm attacking a principle, I also might misunderstand the prin how principles work as a part of trying to make that objection happen. So whether I'm applying principles or whether I'm attacking principles, um, there's an opportunity for me to forget a couple things about principles, uh, particularly good principles that are easy to forget um, or to think too simplistically about or to be too kind of an all or nothing thinker um, about them. So two things, I'm gonna actually do some drawing here to help. One thing to remember about principles is that um, most principles don't apply universally. They only might apply to a particular range of cases and there are like all these other cases you know that don't that it's not trying to say anything about. Okay. So most of the time when we define principles they're, they have the in, an, an intended scope. Actually I'm going to put that here. Intended scope. We don't use them for everything. So for instance, I've got certain rules and principles about how I behave with my students, about what's proper behavior and conduct. Like uh, you won't see me um, you know, going out and doing a bunch of shots of tequila with my students while uh, right before I'm grading all of their finals and giving them final grades. It's not going to happen, right? There's limits. I won't do those sorts of things. I, I mean, I'll do other, you know, there's other things I'm I'm always happy to meet up. I've done this many times. I've met up with students after they're no longer my students. That's okay. But while they're happening, maybe not. But th those rules about behavior that I have for how I behave with my students, that's intended for only that kind of particular context. The context of me being the instructor and me being a student that's in one of my classes. Outside of that, even if I'm a, I'm a teacher and you're and someone's a student, some of those rules don't apply if they're not one of my students, if they're not someone who's in my class or that I've got responsibilities for, there's issues of integrity and ethics and stuff like that. I certainly, this is, I mean, this is how I usually, I don't usually make this example so subtle. Um, usually I just point out how the way, the rules I have for how I behave with my students are not rules I would think about applying with my life partner or my child. Those are going to be different. You know, the, the rules for those for the behavior with students doesn't necessarily apply to these other sorts of scenarios, right? These other sorts of contexts. So one way that I could misuse a principle 
is by treating a principle as if it should be applied across all possible cases as opposed to just the sort of the area or context that the principle was designed for okay that's one mistake I could make or as another way I could I could misuse the principle in this with respect to this aspect of good principles is I could try to bring up counterexamples if I could try to attack the principle and undermine it by bringing up cases and show how dumb it is to use that principle in those cases but these are cases that the rule was never intended to be applied to so like for example let's go back to the one I've been using if a student was like Tim you got a really dumb policy on how you treat your students would you treat your life partner that way and I'd be like that doesn't matter that's not that kind of case is not what this principle is intended to apply to it's a wrong scope right just like that that's not a counterexample if you were gonna get a counterexample to a principle it would have to be in the territory that the principle is designed to handle okay so that's one thing about good principles is that they might have a limited scope they may not be trying to apply to all cases now one of the reasons why this can get a little trickier or why we might make this mistake is that at least in philosophy a lot of philosophers are trying to come up with principles that can be applied universally without exceptions that we're we're interested in what's contingent but we kind of need to figure out what's universal to figure out even what's contingent there's actually another interesting Kantian argument I could present about that if you're curious sometime um, but that you know, even to make judgments about particular cases requires making some more universal claims in order to interpret that you've noticed I mean just as a quick argument here without getting into like all of Kant's philosophy or something just think about how often uh, this quarter we've had to use our background assumptions about how the world is to identify and evaluate a particular case you know just one particular instance of an argument about a particular situation uh, we've had to use all that background knowledge to make sense of it so that's a that's a little, that's a mini argument that's a suggestive argument um, I could give you the full details sometime if you want but there's a relationship here but philosophers generally are looking for what's universal and necessary in which case if you're trying to offer a claim about what is necessary or essential to something if you're offering one of these kinds of universal principles then you have to be prepared for dealing with counterexamples from any old case I mean anything that's conceivable is a potential counterexample to you so that's why it's so hard to do philosophy and to make good philosophical arguments is that there's a lot of opportunity for counterexamples but most of the principles that we use every day in a day-to-day -day sort of basis that are like good rules to follow that are that are good principles to be using they've got exception cases um, they got or, or they got um, they have whole sectors of life or the world that they're not intended to apply to I actually misspoke here because I was thinking about the next aspect of good principles so let's let's get to that so even in the scope that the principles intended to apply to there may be some um, appropriate counterexample cases so in other words um, there might be there might be some cases that are that should be exceptions to the rule you know we've got this principle that is supposed to apply um, into cases in this intended scope right and there might be a couple cases where the principle is inappropriate that are le le legitimate counterexamples be like yeah don't follow the rule even though that's a case that falls in even the intended scope of the principle um, but this could still be a good rule in other words the other aspect the other sort of mistake that you could make that would make you guilty of misuse of a principle is forgetting that sometimes good rules can have a couple counterexamples and still be good rules so for instance um, take something I mean the book uses this, this is a good example this is a good enough one like lying is wrong that's a principle pretty general when we think about it some more we're like mm, there's, a, there's some cases where maybe lying is okay that's permissible um, but that doesn't make us think that lying is uh, that the principle is any worse that it's not a good guideline to have that to recognize that generally lying is wrong like it's good policy to stay away from lying even if there are some exception cases there could still be something morally problematic about it even if in some cases it would be permissible it'd be okay to do it morally um, or may, might even be right to do it. It would be like the best thing to, to, to tell the lie. Um, when, if you're, so you could do this both ways again in how you apply a principle. In other words, you use the principle as if it doesn't have any exceptions ever. You're just like, that's the rule. Don't lie. 
never, no except, no exceptions. Not even going to listen to it. That'd be one way of misusing the principle. The other way is in the context of attacking a principle. In other words, if you can just show one counterexample, you throw the principle in the trash. Can't do that. Where we start getting worried is when the counterexamples start piling up. If you're able to show that, like, hey, this principle doesn't just have a couple one-off ad hoc exception cases. It's like I could be generating counterexamples for days. Like there's whole territories of counterexamples here that are cropping up for this principle. Then we start to get nervous. So if you know a good principle can have a couple exceptions and still be a good rule, you know it's not always right, but it's mostly right. But as soon as you start getting some more, you know you get some more counterexamples here, then we start getting pretty nervous. Okay, now it's starting to look bad for the principle, and that then it's a principle is properly objected to and rejected. But the key idea here is that something could be a good principle and still have a couple counterexamples. That's not enough to defeat it. You got to do more than that. You got to show that there are some more serious problems than just a couple counterexamples. Again, in the context of philosophy, it could be a little different because if a philosopher is trying to figure out what's necessary, then all it takes is one counterexample to ruin it. Kind of like with validity, you know, you're like do the premises, does the truth of the premises guaranteed in a necessary sort of way the truth of the conclusion? That it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Well, if you're making a claim that's that strong, then all it takes is one counterexample, boom, argument invalid. So there's a lot of cases like that in philosophy uh, where philosophers are trying to discuss what's necessary or essential. And again, there, a single counterexample would be a problem. But most of the time, the principles that we're using, or we're not always doing with our philosophy hats on, where we're like, getting it perfectly right, we want to figure out the deepest truth of everything. So when that's not happening, then we're like, still a good rule, even if it didn't work in that one case, that's fine. Um, but if I start, you know, using that principle and a bunch of bad cases keep showing up, then I'm like, mm, time to change the principle. Now it would be a good time to do it. Okay, so just to review... We might be using, principles might be misused in the context of either someone applying the principle into a situation or attacking the principle, saying it's a bad principle. So mistakes could happen in both of these contexts. What's the mistake that could happen? Either way, it could be in either how you're applying or attacking a principle, forgetting two things of, that could be true of good principles. That good principles could have a restricted scope, so there's some whole categories of cases it's not even addressing, and that even within the area of the intended scope of that principle of what it's supposed to apply to, there might even still be a couple counterexamples, still could be a good rule. It's only when the counterexamples start piling that we got a problem. So that's misuse of a principle um, and what we're concerned about there. Okay. You know, in, in my uh, advice here, I talk about, uh, what I'm basically saying here is that if you see a counterexample showing up, um, you should kind of investigate it a little bit more, not just operate under the intuitive judgment that, hey, here's a case in which the principle sucks, but try to ask, you know, why does it suck? Because maybe the grounds on which it sucks would give you a clue about where there's more where that came from, right? Whether the one counterexample is really emblematic of a whole host of counterexamples that could get generated, or whether it really is just kind of a one-off case. Um, I think that that's a great way to pursue it further because um, people can, again, have different controversial views on how to apply this principle or how uh, strongly it should be, how rigorously it should be uh, held accountable. And exploring that, exploring like what's going on with those counterexamples can help give you the tools and the context for figuring out how to resolve that controversy about how you know how strongly we should put the screws to it. Okay, so the last fallacy I want to talk about can be done pretty quickly here, and that's fallacy of the mean. So this is a fallacy. It's, it is a very specific fallacy. A lot of these have been general. So like misuse of a principle could happen anytime principles are being thrown around, which is almost always. Um, is ought fallacy is a little more specific, but there's a lot of things that fall under the is ought fallacy. Um, including, actually, here, this is an important note. Before we do mean, we'll do mean later. It'll be quick. Um, is ought actually is a broad category that includes a bunch of other fallacies we've already talked about, like um, fallacy of common opinion. Everyone believes it, therefore we should believe it. It makes sense for us to do that. There's normativity involved in rational reasoning. 
So, um, you know, the fact that everyone does an action, therefore it must be okay, that would be appeal to uh, popular opinion or common opinion and also is ought fallacy or appeal to tradition. This is how we've done it in the past, so we should continue to do it that way, that it would be right to continue to do it. That's a normative conclusion based on just a historical descriptive fact about how things have been done. So that's also is odd. So there's a lot of things that kind of qualify there. So is odd, I'd say, is a, a, a more general one. It fits in a lot of cases, but it's only going to be relevant in cases where there's a normative conclusion. When someone is defending a normative conclusion, only then you even have to start looking for is odd to see whether it might be what's going on. Okay. So that's a that gives it a little more specificity. False alternatives, uh, you know, it, it's going to depend on whether the uh, the argument or the reasoning that's being brought up is talking about a range of possibilities or not. So I'd say it's maybe medium. Fallacy of division and composition have to do with part-whole relationships, so that also makes them more specific. But within that, you know, a lot of things, this, is, this, is, this covers a lot of different instances, a lot of different topics, a lot of, this could come up just about any time. So these ones are say a little on the medium side too. But you kind of you can perk up your ears when you're seeing part whole relationships happening. I mean, it's kind of like um, is ought fallacy in the sense that uh, talks about sets and subsets is almost as common as talking about normative versus descriptive claims. I mean that those things are um, aspects to our re like I kind of frame this whole lecture. There are aspects of reasoning that are kind of ubiquitous. They're all over the place. Um, the patterns are more specific here, what to listen for. Okay, fallacy of the mean is ultra-specific. This is a very, very specific situation that's getting called out. Um, fallacy of the mean, is the problem here is assuming that the moderate or middle view between two extremes must be the best or right one, and this is the key part, simply because it is the middle view. There are many cases where the moderate or middle view is maybe right, but it, they are right not because they are the middle view, but because of other reasons that recommend them. Like, generally, you know, you if you've got two extreme positions, maybe the moderate position, you kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, but the funny thing about moderate positions, and th this is especially true um, in philosophy, where we, we talk about, like, pluralistic theories that aren't all or nothing. It's like, like if you got a pluralistic moral theory, then instead of having, like, one supreme moral principle, maybe you got five. Um, like, I'm thinking of W.D. Ross's uh, Prima Facie Duties. It's got five, you know, and they don't really have anything to do with each other. They're, like, just like this, that, and that. Let's put them all together, right? Have that be the moral theory. Whenever you've got those kinds of uh, moderate positions or pluralistic positions, the hope is that you get the best of both worlds. But the danger is that by putting these things together or being sort of in between little bits of both, they're actually inheriting the problems of all those different components as well. So it's, it can be kind of a double-edged sword. Um, I brought up Aristotle here. Aristotle's really, really famous um, for arguing this principle of the intermediate in his ethical theory, that when you're trying to figure out... I mean, Aristotle's talking about virtue and vice, uh, character traits, whether they're good or bad. Um, like for uh, His favorite example is, is... I don't know if it's his favorite, but it's, a, it's one of his favorites. Uh, is the virtue of courage. So if you have the virtue of courage, that seems to be kind of in between two extremes. That like courage is feeling the right amount of fear about dangerous situations. If you feel too much fear about dangerous situations, then that'll be that'll make you into a coward. You will not enter into dangerous situations because you're so paralyzed by fear when that's really the right thing to do. But if you feel too little fear, about dangerous situations, then you'll be foolhardy. You won't have any compunction about doing dangerous things, even when there's no good reason to do those dangerous things. You don't respect the danger. So Aristotle's arguing, you know, courage as a virtue is really in between foolhardiness and cowardice, which is basically just, you know, not fe feeling too much fear or too little fear. Uh, those two extremes are bad, and it's the moderate one. The right amount of fear is the is the right thing, and he. He has this um, principle of the intermediate, which is basically saying that pretty much all the virtues work this way. Pretty much is the important part here, though. He's saying most virtues are the sort of moderate between feeling too much or feeling too little. Feeling too much pain or too little pain. Too much pleasure, too little pleasure about something or a certain arena of human life. But even Aristotle, who like makes the biggest deal about this, about the intermediate being so important, even he acknowledges that 
um, things being the moderate view doesn't make them automatically good. That this is just a general guideline. It's not an absolute principle. It's not a necessary principle to be applied without exceptions, right? This is be like misuse of a principle. And I've, I've actually had this is a perfect example because I've had students in my ethics class um, misrepresent Aristotle this way. They'd be like, well, Aristotle's dumb because if I take the principle of the intermediate in this situation, then it gets the wrong result. And be like, okay, so you found a counterexample. That doesn't mean it's a bad rule. It still might be the pattern might generally hold and it's a good principle to follow. And Aristotle, when he presents it, he says, there are some things that are by definition good and by definition bad. So there's no way of like doing them moderately. Like the whole thing for him with virtue is to try to be uh, an excellent person, to develop excellence in your character and abilities. Um, to kind of you might say like grow as a person, to flourish, to be the best that you can be, kind of thing. Um, it's a little more nuanced than that, but that just gets you in the ballpark. And Aristotle says it's not like you should moderately pursue excellence or moderately pursue virtue. Those are things that are always good. You want to maximize those. You don't want to do them in moderation. You want to get as much as you can. And there's certain actions, like say, um, murder, or something. That's like, this is by definition bad. You shouldn't be like doing the right amount of murdering. You know, just a moderate amount of murder, not too much. You know, but not too little. You know, you need to do a little bit of murdering. That that's always bad for Aristotle. Never right. So, um, and I argue he's very wise to say that. <laughs> so. Um, that's the problem of fallacy to me. Compromises can be right, you know, um, but to compromise just for the sake of compromise or to be the moderate position just for the sake of moderacy is not enough. Um, the, well, probably one of, one of the most famous cases, I'll, I'll, I'll close it off here and then I'll be done. I've already taken so much time, but they, I've kind of gone on more extended descriptions. I hope this has been helpful and, I, and, it's, and it's actually been worth it. Um, maybe you remember uh, a a British politician named Neville Chamberlain who very famously uh, made the sort of history kind of looks unfavorably about his choice now. Um, that I think it's called the Munich Pact. Here, actually, let me double check and make sure I'm not giving you misinformation. Munich Agreement. Um, Neville Chamberlain sat down with Hitler and they negotiated a kind of peace um, that gave some things to the Nazis, but then also kind of uh, set a precedent or a rule. There's an there's an understanding that Germany wouldn't press further and try to uh, take more territory, which obviously they did not respect. Okay, but this kind of compromise, um, Chamberlain thought was going to create peace. He says, "Peace in our time." You know, it's a famous photograph of him holding this piece of paper. Totally wrong. <laughs> not the right decision. Negotiating with the Nazis is not the correct thing to do. To compromise with, with the kind of thing that they were about, with their political vision for the world, um, probably not appropriate. So, just the fact that um, something is the compromised position or the moderate position doesn't make it automatically right. Doesn't make it automatically wrong either. That'd be its own kind of fallacy. Um, to say like, well, because you're in the middle, I guess you don't stand for anything. You must have an extreme view to have a legitimate view. That wouldn't be right either. Sometimes compromises are right, sometimes they're not right. We have to actually look at the issues rather than just the form in which the proposal is coming. So uh, that's all I got for you this time. We got through a bunch of fallacies, which is great. And we've got, um, we're heading into another fun territory. I, there, there's scores and scores of fallacies. These are a hand-picked selection of my some of my favorites, kind of like a greatest hits highlight reel. So after this, we've got um, arguing for ignorance, um, I do want to talk about that one. I, sometimes I skip that one. Fallacy of popular wisdom, that's a great one. And then this section is, is kind of some of the classics. The rebuttal fallacies, ignoring the counter evidence, abuse of ad hominem, poisoning the well, two wrongs, attacking straw men. All of these, so there's a few more fallacies for us to get through. All these fallacies um, in the rebuttal section are all about like how we either give criticism or respond to criticism and the kind of one of the reasons I think these are so interesting is that they they aren't just like irrational but they're also um, insincere a lot of them are a matter of trying to make it look like I'm being a critical reasoner or make it look like I'm open-minded or charitable or that I'm engaging with my opponents when I'm not really 
or not doing that sincerely. So there's kind of a um, there's a deception, a, a a kind of hypocrisy that goes on with those fallacies that that kind of gives them a little extra bite. So I'm very excited to talk about those. Uh, there's a reason I close with them. I think I think they they got a lot of punch to them. So um, I think we'll probably split this up into two more lectures. So I think we'll probably have five total. Um, I don't think I'll be able to finish off all the rest of them in the next one, but um, until then, we'll do some more. So see you then.